Hey, it's Sila Social Studies. Hey guys, and welcome back to Sheila Social Studies. All right, so today we're going to be talking about war movements that were going on on the home front here in the United States during World War I. So World War I, as you recall, was a total war. In previous wars, citizens were not held responsible for these wartime efforts. Now, it's true that soldiers came from the general population, but that was really the extent of the average person. And during World War I, the United States was fresh off the Gilded Age in that rapid industrialization and urbanization of the nation. They mobilized for the war on many fronts that relied heavily on American citizens. And on the military side, yes, more and more troops were being trained in forts all over the nation. But on a civilian side, President Roosevelt created the Committee on Public Information, which would help persuade the public to support the war effort by stepping up the production of war supplies. So questions remain like, how can you get so many Americans behind the war effort, and how you, can you actually pay for a war of this magnitude? After all, the cost of the United States was nearly $32 billion, or roughly 50% of its gross domestic product. So how did the U.S. government get the word out to Americans and instill the type of patriotism and nationalism that was needed to fuel this money machine? One such option was propaganda. And propaganda, by definition, is information uh, which is especially of biased nature, which is used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. And the U.S. government found lots of success in the use of posters that showed the Germans looking like brutes who were stealing American women or asking people to grow victory gardens or trading your silver in to make bullets or even telling you to enlist in the armed forces. And a good use of propaganda was to raise money to fight the war. So after the passing of the War Revenue Act in 1917, the wealthy in the United States were getting taxed at a rate of about 67%. And this was enough money to raise, uh, this was enough to raise enough money to pay for about one third of the war. So how could citizens foot the bill for the other two thirds? Well, this was through Liberty Bonds. And Liberty Bonds or War Bonds are pieces of paper that a citizen purchases from the government. And it's basically a loan uh, to the American people from the government. And they would be sold at a lesser dollar amount than what it's worth with a promise that it would earn anywhere from 3 to 4% and be purchased back from the government at a higher price. So for example, a person would purchase a Liberty Bond worth $20 but would only pay $10. And after the war was over, that person could sell their bond back to the government for more money, possibly $20 plus 4%. And selling these Liberty Bonds helped pay for roughly about 21 of the $32 billion uh, of World War I's cost to the United States. So how else could people help in the war effort? Well, once the war was in full swing and Americans were on board, the government found other ways for common people to help during the war. So government agencies uh, like the War Industry Board and the Fo Food Administration worked diligently to supply troops with food and supplies. And the government would promote rationing, which is basically using less of everyday items so the government can send more to the troops. People would be asked to have meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays where they'd be asked not to consume those items on those days to help save some for the troops overseas. And many Americans would also plant victory gardens in their yard. And these victory gardens were personal backyard gardens that people would grow food for themselves and donate the rest to the war effort. And by the end of the war, victory gardens supplied over about one and a half million quarts of canned fruits and vegetables to the soldiers over in Europe. And after the war was over, many of these Americans continued to grow these victory gardens. And with the war firing on all cylinders, so many men and women got shipped off to war, there were many labor shortages in the United States. And here's a couple of examples of, uh, you'll see one coming up about labor shortages, but we have this one about buying a Liberty Bond, this propaganda. And we have also another one about German boots keeping them off American soil to buy Liberty Bonds. And here's one right here about do the job he left behind. 
So American factories needed millions of new workers to meet this huge wartime production demand. And since the beginning of the war, the usual suspects for these factory jobs were immigrants. And they were in low supply because since the start of the war, our nation's borders were effectively closed, shutting out any new wave of immigrants trying to come to America. And these shortages created opportunities for Americans who would normally not be seen in the factories. So who was going to pull up this slack? First, it was women. Many women took on new roles during the war to help this wartime effort. And women left the home by the millions and nearly two million women took positions in the factories, making things like munitions, weapons, and vehicles. And they would take up manual labor positions on the farms. Women volunteered their services in the war when over 25,000 of them served during the war in non-combat positions like nurses and cooks in Europe. And these new roles were not accepted by all women as many actually protested America's participation in the war. Here's some women right here who were building some bombs during the war. It's a little factory a picture of some women building some bombs in a factory. So this is who was taking up the wartime effort. Another group of people who took up wars in the northern factories and western farms were Mexican Americans. And during this war, a few hundred thousand heeded the call and joined the armed forces to fight in the war. And others moved into places like Texas and north to Iowa, taking a factory and farm jobs in the Midwest. And a final group to take up this, uh, to, to take up the slack and fill new roles in World War I were African Americans. This large portion took up the call to arms when over 350,000 African American men were shipped off to fight in the war. However, starting in 1915, one of the largest and most important migrations happened in the United States, which is called the Great Migration. And the Great Migration is a multi decade migration of millions of African Americans moving from the South to the north to escape discrimination, segregation, and take northern factory jobs. Union memberships increased in the north and started to fight for more rights and better pay. And during the war, more than 4 million unionized workers went on strike. And in 1918, the National Labor War Board was established to help negotiate agreements between management and laborers. Over time, the, uh, the board worked to prevent numerous strikes and settled more than 1,000 labor disputes. So here you have uh, a newspaper article showing strike called and all unions to go out and uh, another one about propaganda about together we win. So you have three different hands. You have a union worker hand or a, a labor union hand. You have the boss's hand and then you have the hand of Uncle Sam trying to keep everybody together. So what happens next? Well, you have Russia. Well, you have Russia, right? You have Russia right there, Vladimir Lenin. And you have the Russian Revolution. And Russia had a disastrous time fighting the war on the Eastern Front. And in 1917, a group of Russians called the Bolsheviks overthrew the Russian government, which consisted of the Tsar Nicholas II and the Romanov family. And this would be the last monarchy in Russian history. This was called the Russian Revolution. Vladimir Lenin was a Bolshevik leader who knew that the war had reached a breaking point as more than 8 million Russians were killed during this war. And Russia was in shambles. Soldiers were deserting by land and by sea and were major food riots in the cities. The Russian famine would go on to kill more than 30 million people by 1922. Lenin would instill a new type of government in Russia called communism. And communism is the belief of equal distribution of wealth and the end of all forms of private property. Lenin's next step as the leader of Russia was to leave the war. And in 1918, Russia and the Central Powers signed the Treaty of Brest-Lavosk, taking Russia out of the war completely. With Russia out of the war, Germany was able to move forces from the Eastern Front and concentrate them on the Western Front and the Americans. In March 1918, the Germans made a significant advance but was unprepared for the fresh, well-trained American forces and were driven back. And Germany made its final offensive attempt when in July 1918, they attempted to cross the Somme and the Marne rivers and these tremendous losses forced the Germans to stop their advance. So here's some Red Cross volunteers in World War One in the trenches. As you can see, there's some women there, and they'd taken soldiers away on uh, on 
on some uh, some carts. And you have patriotic posters, teamwork wins. You have a soldier on top, you have women on the bottom, and they're making things that are supposed to be instilling patriotism into Americans. So what do we have for other wartime efforts? The final wartime efforts that we're going to talk about here are the Espionage Act of 1917, the Sedition Act of 1918, and a Selective Service Act of 1917. It was not uncommon uh, occurrence during wartime in America that the government put laws into place to limit the freedoms or change the rules to aid government's agenda. And during the Civil War, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, and during World War I, the government issued the Espionage and Sedition Acts. And both of these acts were aimed at limiting the freedoms of American during the war. The Espionage Act prohibited obtaining information, recording pictures, or copying descriptions of any information relating to the national defense with intent or reason to believe that the information be used for the injury of the United States or to the advantage of any foreign nation. And the Sedition Act, much like the one passed by Second President John Adams, made it a crime to willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, or abusive language about the form of the government in the United States. The final wartime effort was a Selective Service Act of 1917, and it was no surprise to Americans that there were still people needed to fight in this war. The first way to gather people to fight was, of course, through volunteering, but with over 4.5 million Americans called for active duty, there needed to be another way to get soldiers, and in 1917, the Selective Service Act was enacted to prepare the nation's military for war. It required the men between the ages of 21 and 30 to register for the wartime draft. And out of the 4.5 million active duty soldiers, nearly 3 million were drafted into the service during World War I. The last time the draft had been used in any American war was during the Civil War, and there were violent protests in many cities due to the wealthy having the ability to purchase their way out of service with exemptions. And this time the draft was conducted using a random lottery. Even with the draft in place, there was just over 2 million Americans who made the trip to France and fought in the trenches.